I tell you, we've had an awesome day today. God just has been loving people. The word has been rich. People are receiving. And I pray that you're open up to this and that you're receiving. I pray that even online, people are able to perceive what's going on. But what a blessing. What a blessing God is. How much he loves us. It's just awesome. You know, I started talking about uh, how God wants us to succeed. He created us for success. And I started talking last night about how to become a success. And we challenged the current way of thinking of what a success was. Uh, we showed that God is going to judge our hearts of what sort every person's work is, not what size it is. And then basically I centered on uh, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, that this to me is the definition of what success is. And it's being a living sacrifice. It's just knowing God in an intimate way and then renewing your mind so that you do whatever God wants you to do. You prove His good, acceptable, and perfect will. And if you do that, then you're a success. And God's will may not be big. David was talking about, he's blessed by this, but you know what? If he had $32 million, he would not build this. <laughs> he was telling me about that. This isn't what God put in his heart. This isn't what God put in a lot of people's heart. This is what God has led me to do, but he hadn't led everybody else to do this. God doesn't lead everybody to become a minister and to do the same thing. And sadly, we get to thinking that unless you do something that is really significant, big in the eyes of people, something that grabs the attention and gets you on the front page, that you aren't significant. But God has something for every one of us to do. You know, the guy who was the COO of our ministry until just, uh, I think it was March, uh, he had a friend in Oregon who was a trash collector and they went to church together. And this man told everybody he was called by God to be a trash collector. And he loved it. And people would challenge him like, well, that's not a very noble ambition. You know, that's not a great calling. And he says, hey, these trash collectors need somebody who's a trash collector there to tell them about the Lord. Plus, he says, I get to witness to people every day and just say something nice to them and do something. And he says, what would it be like if we didn't have trash collectors? Think of all of the disease and what our life would be like. He says, man, God needs people who are trash collectors. Most people don't think that way, but I believe that God puts people there. I was talking to a man tonight who is just, you know, going into a situation that most people wouldn't go into. And uh, he's, he's working with people that are it's not a real good thing, but God has him placed there. And he says, man, I am sharing your teaching and we're putting this out and we're reaching people and changing lives. You know, the Lord has a strategic place for every one of us and it's not always behind the pulpit. Matter of fact, just by virtue of numbers, we can't have the majority of people behind the pulpit. We need the majority of people in the workplace. We need people that are politicians. We need people that are out there affecting things. And so we need to reevaluate things about what a success is and what God calls you to do. Let's turn over to Exodus chapter two. I was there this morning sharing about Moses and I shared some really good things. How many of you were not here this morning? You, you are new tonight. Quite a few of you. I encourage you to please get that teaching because it fit perfectly with what I was talking about, about Moses. I read some of these verses, but I want to go back to Exodus chapter two. And I just want to use a, tonight to show you a number of people who were small in the sight of men, but they were big in the sight of God. Little people who were big successes. Amen. Here in Exodus chapter two, it says in verse one, and there went a man of the house of Levi and took the wife, a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him, that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And when she could not longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with uh, slime and with pitch and put the child therein. And she laid it in the flags by the river's brink and his sister stood afar off to see what would be done to him. And of course, we know that this was Moses and Pharaoh's daughter took him as her own son and raised him. And Moses became this guy that here we are 4,000 years later talking about Moses. I mean, Moses 
was an awesome guy. God used him in a powerful way. But did you know nothing would have happened with Moses if his mother hadn't uh, seen that she just knew in her heart that there was something special about him and she decided to put her life on the line for her son and she kept him as long as she could. And then she took this act of desperation, this step of faith and put him in this basket and cast him adrift. And you know, everybody talks about Moses, but not very many people in here know Moses' mother's name. Her name was Jochebed, as you read in other places. And this, this woman was mightily used of God. You know, today we sometimes will talk about a woman if she's a housewife and a mother as actually that's got to where some people aren't, uh, you know, they won't tell you that they are a stay at home mom, that they're a housewife, like somehow or another that makes them a second class citizen. Again, today our society has put success into a realm where you have to do something significant, reach large numbers of people, make income, have a career or something. But I tell you, the biggest thing that any person will ever do is minister to your own family. Now, God can call you to do things beyond that, but that's the greatest ministry any of us have. And I admire a woman who just is a wife and a mother. You know, until recently, that's basically the role that women had. And I'm not saying that they can't do other things. We got women that work for us. Audrey Mack over here travels and ministers. That's great. God calls us to do different things, but I'm saying we shouldn't look at the role of being a mother as somehow or another being insignificant. Every great man or woman who's ever done anything in the world had a mother. And that mother is a big factor in their life. Here's a woman that put her life on the line. And you know what? I believe that she fulfilled God's will for her life. And because of it, it brought deliverance to an entire nation. I know that this may sound really insignificant and people are thinking, man, we need something more than that. But you know, it's important. Today, we got so many people that, that uh, you know, their career is more important and they put their children in daycare and stuff like this and somebody else is raising your kid. And there are some people who do a good job doing that, but I tell you, nobody's gonna love your kid as much as you love your kid. Nobody will do as good a job as what you can do with your own kid. And I, I think that we have let this world influence us in a negative way and because of it, it's not good. You know, this article that I read to our directors yesterday, uh, a, a guy who was a uh, professor in England, a Brit, he was talking about that he works among the poor and in prisons and stuff like that. And he says that the uh, children that are born to a single mom is nearly 100% in Great Britain among the prisoners and the poor people that he worked with. Nearly 100%. Man, there's a lot of absentee dads. And you know what? People are looking to make their life significant and do something. Being a mom or a dad is a significant thing. And that we need some people that would take that seriously. They would recognize that, man, this is a calling of God. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. Again, I know that some people, well, that's, you know, I've got more ambition than that. The Lord said, you'll be witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, and under the uttermost parts of the earth. You have to start at home. And there's a lot of people that have all these grandiose ideas and they aren't being faithful with the few things that God has given them. Luke chapter 16 says, if you aren't faithful with little, God won't commit to your trust more. And there is a progression. There is a promotion in uh, life and in ministry. And I tell you, God wants you to just start where you are and be faithful. And many people have their eyes so far out in the future that they are stumbling over things in the present. And I'm telling you, we just need to learn to be faithful in small things. That's really not a small thing. Being a parent is a big, big thing. And we need to take it seriously and recognize it. Man, you got a responsibility. If you bring a child into the world, you got a responsibility to that child. Amen or oh me. 
Look over here in Genesis chapter 39. Let me show you another person. This is talking about Joseph. And some, some people might think, well, Joseph, man, what a success he was. He not only saved the whole Egyptian empire, but man, he fed all of these nations around. His family was brought together. I mean, Joseph was a powerful guy. But look at this in uh, chapter 39. This is after he was sold into slavery by his brothers. And in chapter 39, it says, and Joseph was brought down to Egypt and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph and he was a prosperous man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Now it is true that Joseph went on to become the mightiest man, second most important, powerful man in Egypt. And God used him in a big way. But right here he is being sold as a slave. This is before he had any accomplishments, anything that anybody would look at and say that he was a success. And yet, you know, the way they sold a slave, when you were buying a slave, you needed to inspect your merchandise. And so they literally stripped them naked. And Joseph was standing there stripped naked so that the buyers could see what they were buying, standing there on an auction block naked. And God says, he was a prosperous man. He didn't have a penny to his name. He didn't even have any clothes on. He was being sold his property. He had been forsaken by his family. And God says he was a prosperous man. And here is Potiphar, the guy who was buying him that I'm sure had on the nicest robes, all of the jewels. I'm sure he was dressed to the max. And God didn't say Potiphar was a prosperous man. He said Joseph was a prosperous man and God was with him. Man, if you believe the scripture, you've got to redefine what prosperity is. Joseph had a relationship with God. Joseph loved God. And Joseph is one of my favorite characters in the Bible. Some people interpret his actions towards his brothers as being vindictive and vengeful and he punished them to get even. But that is so inconsistent with his nature. That's so inconsistent what the scripture reveals about him. You know, it was 22 years before Joseph saw his dreams come to pass. But after 13 years, he became the most powerful man in Egypt. He had all of the armies of Egypt at his command and Joseph could have done anything he wanted to and he didn't go down and make his dreams come to pass. He could have surrounded his brothers and he said, bow the knee and he could have made it come to pass. But he waited nine years until God supernaturally brought his brothers by. And then after he revealed himself, they thought that he was going to kill them. They thought that he was going to punish them. And he said, look, God didn't, you know, don't punish yourselves. God sent me before you. God did this to preserve lives. Anyway, I'm not going to teach on Joseph, but everything that Joseph did is inconsistent with him being petty and operating in unforgiveness and punishing his brothers. You know, if I had time, I could show you that Reuben, the oldest son of Israel, committed incest with his, with his stepmother. Simeon and Levi, the next two children, went in and murdered hundreds of men in a city and wiped out an entire city. Judah committed incest with his daughter-in-law and his daughter-in-law got pregnant by him. And these were wicked, 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 evil men and God used Joseph to preserve their lives, yes, in the nation of Israel, but he also used Joseph to bring these men to the end of themselves. And that's what it was all about. And when these guys finally repented and they said, you know what? Our sins have found us out. This is because of what we did to our youngest brother, Joseph. And when they repented and said, this is justice, we deserve it, we submit. And when they yielded themselves, that's when Joseph revealed himself to him. He wasn't punishing these guys. Joseph was a guy who was in relationship with God and he served God faithfully as a slave. He had a relationship with God and he was doing what God told him to do. And he was a success long before the world measured him as a success. When he was a slave being sold on the auction block, totally stripped naked, Joseph was a success. When he was put in prison, 
He was a success because he was doing what God had told him to do. And you can read about this later in the 39th chapter that when Joseph went down, he, the keeper of the prison gave him control of everything. And he said he didn't even know what was going on. He gave the total control of the prison to Joseph. In those days, if the prisoners escaped or something, the, the jailer was put to death for them. And this guy literally put his life on the line because he saw the blessing of God in Joseph. And Joseph had changed the whole atmosphere of that prison so that he walked in and saw the butler and the baker and they were sad. And he says, what's happened that you're sad today? You know, duh, they were in prison. <laughs> Most people would think you're supposed to be sad, but in Joseph's prison, people were probably being treated better than they were living on the outside. These people were rejoicing and it was unusual to find somebody that was sad. Joseph was a success in prison. You know, when Jamie and I were going through our hard times and stuff and people stayed away from our meetings by the thousands and we struggled and we had all of these problems. You know what? I believe in the sight of God, we were a success because we were doing what God called us to do. And there's people now that begin to see some good things happening and, and they, they begin to say, oh man, you know, that's success. No, we were, success isn't something that you do. You are a success if you have a relationship with God and if you're doing what God called you to do. And even if you haven't seen the full manifestation of your blessing yet, and even if things aren't going your way, if you are committed to God and following God, I'm telling you, you're a success if you're a garbage collector. You're a success if you're being sold into slavery. You're a success if you've been lied about and put in prison. You're a success. Success is knowing God and doing what God has called you to do. And the results or up to God, whether it produces something that the world recognizes and everybody pats you on the back for, or you may never get recognition in this life. But you know what? If you're doing what God has called you to do, and if you are loving him with all of your heart, I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, you're a success. And on the other hand, if you are doing all of these things that get the acclaim of people, and if your mantle is filled with awards and trophies. And if you got money in the bank and the nicest car and you don't love God with all of your heart, and if you wouldn't follow him and do what he tells you to do, you aren't a success. Amen, Amen or oh me. Amen. I tell you, that's better preaching than you're listening. Let me look over here in second Kings chapter five. Here's another example of a person that, you know, a lot of people wouldn't consider somebody who was a success. But 2 Kings chapter 5 is the story about Naaman, the leper. And it says in verse 1, Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria and he was a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. You know, this, this, is, this is classic right here. This guy was a mighty man. He was honorable. He was the most important. He was probably the general over all of the armies, second in command of the king. He was a mighty man, but he was a leper. You know, it doesn't matter what you accomplish Everybody's got a butt. <laughs> you can take that any way you want. There's a butt in everybody's life. And I can, I can tell you, it doesn't matter what you've done, there's always a butt. You've got this problem, but you've got that problem. He was a mighty man, but he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and it brought away captive out of the land of Israel, a little maid. And she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. You know, this little girl, she was a captive. They had probably killed her parents. 
or at least enslave them, they were taken as prey, as spoil of battle. And this was a little girl that had been taken from her home, possibly her parents killed, certainly friends killed. She was a slave serving a master. You know what? Most people today would think she's got every right to be bitter, to be angry, to be upset. And yet she loved her master. And she said, told her, her, uh, the wife of Naaman that she was serving, says, would to God that Naaman could go to Israel because the man of God would heal him. And you know, here is a slave girl that most people would think, what a terrible situation. And yet this woman, this girl knew God and knew enough about him to say that, man, if he could hook up with Elijah or Elisha, that he would be healed. And God used that little girl to cause Naaman to go down, bent with Elijah, Elisha, and he got healed. And I mean, it was miraculous. And Naaman turned to the Lord. And I mean, he served God with all of his heart and God used her in a mighty way. And you know what? She probably outside of this would have never been mentioned. We would have never have known of this little girl. And yet here's just a little girl, a young child, a slave who knew God, knew what God could do and spoke up. And because of that, a man was changed. And I believe that many of the people in that nation got changed. Naaman was a leper. And after dipping seven times in the Jordan River, he came up and he was just completely healed. Man, that's awesome. Did you know that that little miracle happened by one person who was doing something that was insignificant in the sight of God? And yet I can guarantee you for a slave girl like that, to have a good attitude, to love the person who probably was responsible for killing her family and making her a slave. She had dealt with some bitterness, some problems in her heart. She had a relationship with God and she was just serving God the only way she had to serve him. And because of it, here we are 4,000 years later talking about this little girl, doesn't even have a name. And I guarantee you someday in heaven, we'll be talking to her and man, what a story she's got. She's impacted people for over 4,000 years, an insignificant thing. And you could just keep doing this, going through scripture. You could take about the, talk about the woman that came and anointed the feet of Jesus, uh, you know, and, and everybody else ridiculed him. If you knew what kind of woman this was, a prostitute. And yet Jesus said that she's done this and wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, this that she has done will be spoken about her as a memorial. Jesus honored this woman and put honor on her because she had messed up her life. She had done a lot of things wrong, but she had come into relationship. She had received the grace of God and she was giving back the only way she knew how. She was worshiping the Lord and God honored her because of it. Man, that's awesome. When we stand before God, God is going to judge things a lot differently. You know, you see somebody who's on television or doing something and we think, man, that's awesome. You know, it says in James chapter three, and you know, uh, brethren, don't be many masters because in many things we offend all. I guarantee you to whom God has given much, much is going to be required. I think the people that are going to shine in eternity when they stand before God are people that may not have been given as much influence or as much to do, but you know what? They were faithful in what they did. And God is going to judge you based on your faithfulness to what he called you to do, not based on how big it is and whether or not lots of people have ever seen it and have taken notice of it. And I tell you, this is so important. I think that today people are feeling insignificant And they just don't realize this. But if you have a relationship with God, that is the most important thing. And then just doing what God calls you to do, what opportunity he gives you. God is pleased with you. God loves you. He's more pleased with you than what any of us know. I really believe that. We make it hard on ourselves. We criticize ourselves. We're the ones that give us all of these problems. You know, I, Arthur was talking this morning about the devil and how, yes, he does exist, but it's not really the devil that's the problem. 
And I really believe that with many of us, the devil can take a vacation because all he did was teach you a few things and then you just are doing a bang up job of condemning yourself and living a defeated life and the devil can go on vacation because you're doing a great job on your own. I believe sometimes the devil looks at us and thinks, man, I never thought of that. He's probably taking notes from us about what a great way to destroy a person's life. We're the ones that are empowering the devil. We're the ones that are condemning ourselves. You know, Jesus has given us so much freedom. It says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse two, that we should have no more conscience of sin. Man, Jesus has obliterated all of our sin, past, present, and even future sins, things that you haven't even committed yet. You're already forgiven of. Sin is not the problem with God. God is not imputing anybody's sins unto you. He loves you. God is pleased with you. If you ever understood that, man, how that would change your life. You know, the scripture that I used last night, Romans chapter 12, verse one, it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Did you know that the whole way that he was motivating people, he says, by the mercy of God, I beseech you to do this. Most people feel it's an obligation. It's a debt through gritted teeth. Well, I guess I ought to commit myself to God. Paul was approaching it from a different standpoint. Because of the goodness of God, because of the mercy of God, he asked you to be a living sacrifice. You know, I can turn it around and say it this way, that if you aren't sold out to God, if God isn't the most important thing in your life, if like Jill was singing tonight, your favorite thing is not to spend time with the Lord. If that isn't what just winds your clock, amen, I mean, gets you going. You don't know the mercy of God. You don't know how good God is. Man, God is so awesome. He is so good that if you ever got a revelation of how good God is, everything else would pale in comparison. You know, Sunday at church, uh, Case and Cruz was singing and he just started singing this old song about turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of God uh, of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. If you ever see how much God loves you, nothing else is worth anything. All of the acclaim of people is nothing compared to just the praise, the acceptance of God. God loves you. And most of us won't let God love us. You know, the scripture says, let God, uh, let God be magnified, which has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. Psalms 35, 27. God loves you and he's pleased when you prosper. He wants to reveal himself. He wants to bless you, but you have to let him do that. And part of the reason that we don't feel the pleasure of God is because we are just so used to condemning ourselves. We think that that is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But I tell you, God loves you. And if you could ever experience him just thanking you for things, you know, that very statement right there to a lot of people is like terrible, like God would never thank me. You know, whatever I've done good, I guarantee you I've done more bad than I've done good. God's not like that. God will thank you. You know, I remember when Jamie and I were getting started, we went and saw Catherine Kuhlman and we were just overwhelmed seeing blind eyes open, people come out of wheelchairs, people that I took off of stretchers and had to put them in a chair that didn't weigh 60 pounds and then later I'd see them running and pushing their stretcher and doing things that it was impossible to do. And we were just so in the presence of God that after the service was over, Jamie and I sat there for like an hour, like this is holy ground. How can people get up and leave because the service is over? And we were just awestruck and we were sitting there just worshiping God. And I remember what it was like just saying, thank you, Jesus. And I held a meeting in Omaha, Nebraska, where we saw a number of blind eyes open and deaf ears open in one service. And when I left, there were people just sitting there exactly the same way as what Jamie and I were years before. 
And I remember driving back to the hotel and I was just so thankful. I said, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you are using me to touch people's lives the way that other people have been used to touch my life. And I was just so thankful. And I was saying, thank you, Jesus. And I was praising him. And the Lord spoke to me and he said, well, thank you, Andrew. And when he said that, it just shocked me like, God is saying thank you to me. It was so abnormal to me that at first I thought this couldn't be God. And you know what? The Lord just started showing me that that's the way that he is. God appreciates you. You know, we just think that every day you're just, we just have a sin consciousness. I, I was listening to this guy's tape one time entitled Turkeys and Eagles, Peter Lord. It's a classic teaching. It is amazing. And anyway, he was talking about how we have sin consciousness and we just do things. And so at the eight o'clock Sunday morning service, he said, how many of you have sinned today? And nearly every hand in the congregation went up. His wife's hand went up. <laughs> and he just was shocked. He says, what have you done? It's only eight o'clock in the morning. What have you done by eight o'clock? And she says, well, I can't think of anything particularly, but you know, I just constantly fail and come short. And I know that I've sinned today. And he took off on that and started talking about how we just have this sin consciousness. He says, why don't you acknowledge the good things that you do? Hey. And people say, well, what have I done good? Well, you got up. <laughs> That's good. There's some people that just lay in bed. They're depressed and they don't even go to the effort of getting up and going to church. You got up and went to church. You brushed your teeth. That's good. But you know, that's righteous. That's the right thing to do. Combed your hair, put on clothes. You did a lot of righteous things. But no, we don't even think about that. If you were to say, how many of you have done something good today? Most people, well, I hadn't done anything good, but you got out of bed, you cleaned up, you did what's necessary. You know what? God appreciates us just getting up and showing up sometimes. That's good. But no, we would never sit there. We don't look at the good. We just are quick to criticize and look at all of the bad. But I'm telling you, God sees things differently. If you love God with all of your heart, and if you are doing what God gave you to do, he may not have given you what he gave me to do. He may not lead you to do what he led somebody else to do. But did you know with the people that are represented right here in this room tonight, I can guarantee you there are millions of people's lives who would be impacted if every one of us just made ourselves a living sacrifice and then begin to live for God and every single day took opportunity, took advantage of whatever opportunity it is. Did you know that probably nearly the majority of people in Woodland Park would have been impacted today Amen. by you driving through and getting gas, buying something, going to eat, doing whatever, if every one of us was just living for the Lord and loving God and taking advantage of whatever opportunity we have, we would impact this area. People would be born again. It would change the entire culture. I couldn't tell you how many times I've gone in and seen somebody who just is having a rough day. You can see it. They're struggling. And I'll just go in and say something nice to them. I've gone in before. I remember after one of our meetings, uh, a group of four of us pastors went out to eat and it was like one o'clock in the morning. So we went to this truck stop and there was a woman there waiting on us and she wasn't uh, rude or anything, but you could just tell she was discouraged and you have to fight these pastors to get the ticket. <laughs> you know, I went to a place today where I've told them in the past, you always give me the ticket. If you don't, you're in trouble. We may not come back. And they always give me the ticket, but Audrey grabbed it from that lady before I could do anything. When you're out with a group of preachers, you got to fight them for the ticket. Man, everybody wants the blessing. And anyway, I knew that I was, I was going to have a hard time getting this ticket for these four preachers. So I excused myself like I had to go to the restroom and I got this lady and I said, I want to pay for this. So she gave me the bill and it was, you know, it was a truck stop. It was probably only 25 bucks or whatever for the meal. And I just gave her a $50 tip. 
And so she came running to the table after she looked at it and she said, uh, you made a mistake. You meant to give me a $5 tip and you gave me a 50. And I said, no, I just felt like God wanted me to give you that 50 and just let you know that he loves you and that God, whatever you're going through, he loves you. And this woman just began to cry. She was working three jobs. She was a single mom. She was worn out and she just needed a little bit of encouragement. And she sat down and started talking to us. And there was four preachers there. We led her to the Lord, got her baptized in the Holy Spirit. And man, I spend millions of dollars every month trying to reach people. 50 bucks to get a person born again is cheap. That was a good investment. And you know what? If every one of us just loved God, and then if you're out to eat and if you see somebody who's discouraged, and you know, if they are rough to you and say something, you don't know what they've been through. Maybe God sent you there so that instead of them serving you and laying their life down like you're the only person alive, maybe God sent you across their path to be a blessing to them. And if you just bless them, think of what it would do. You know, Dave Hinton's got a story about traveling through, I think it was Illinois and, and the other guy was driving a van and they got to worship in the Lord and he got to speeding doing 70 or something in a 35 and a cop stopped him. <laughs> and this cop was mad and angry. And anyway, David was the passenger and he just felt the prompting of the Lord. And he looked at that officer and he said, officer, has anybody told you that Jesus loves you or that they love you today? And man, he looked down and he said, no. And David says, well, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> That's what he was thinking. But he just went ahead and he says, well, let me be the first to tell you that Jesus loves you. And his cop says, do you know what I was doing when you came over that hill? He says, I had my gun cocked and in my mouth and I was about to kill myself. And David got to lead him to the Lord. And and, and when they came back through, after going up to Canada, they stopped and visited this guy and man, it had turned his life around and changed him. Just because somebody loves God and probably if David hadn't have told this story, it would have never made the headlines. Large numbers of people would have never heard about it. And yet in the sight of God, you know what? That's a success. Getting stopped for a speeding ticket. And you know what? God worked it together for good. And I believe that God says, thanks, David, for just speaking to that guy. God wanted to reach that man. You meet people like this every day and we're looking for the big things. And I'm not saying that God doesn't want us to dream big. I'm not telling everybody to throw all of your big dreams aside, but I'm saying we are looking so hard for something big that we're missing God in all of the little small things every day. And that's what makes you a success. You know what, Jamie and I, I believe in God's sight. God was pleased with us back when we were struggling and when things didn't look good and everybody was criticizing us. And I mean, if we would have been arrested for being a minister and put on trial, there wouldn't have been enough evidence to convict us. We had nobody following us. Nobody was listening to anything. And yet I believe God saw us as a success because of the best of our ability. We were doing what God called us to do. And you know what? That's a success. Look over here in second Kings chapter seven. Let me show you another example. Second Kings chapter seven is, uh, is where Elisha prophesied that there was going to be this abundance. And yet Samaria was surrounded by the Syrians. Guess who was the captain of the Syrian army? Naaman, the guy who had been healed of leprosy by Elisha and their armies were surrounded and the drought got so bad that people were selling animal dung for exorbitant prices. And it got so bad that these two women covenanted together to kill and eat their own children. It was a severe situation. And in the midst of this situation, it says in 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 3, And there were four leprous men at the entering end of the gate, and they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city and we shall die there. And if we sit here, uh, 
we die also. Now therefore come and let us fall unto the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. Man, I think this is an awesome passage of scripture. This is impeccable logic. Some people are so fearful of death or failure or whatever that they won't ever consider it. But what are the options? You know, sometimes death is better than sitting there and just dying slowly. I really believe that. Just like David was talking tonight about they told him he was going to die. And he says, well, so are you. And he just decided that until he died, he was going to live. Man, that's great logic. These lepers had been cast out. They weren't even enjoying the little bit of food that they had in the city. They were starving to death. And they said, we got to do something. If we go into the city, we're going to die. If we sit here, we're going to die. Let's go out to the Syrians. And if they kill us, we're going to die anyway. And they overcame the fear of death and were motivated to do something. Man, I've used this on a lot of people about Bible college. I've had people that year after year after year, I go to see them and they say, you know, I know we need to come, but man, I, I'm worried about what happens if I do this and what if I do this? And I've just told people finally, I said, how long are you going to sit there until you die? You're dying slowly. You don't like the way things are going. It was Einstein that said it's insanity to do the same thing and expect different results. And yet there are people that they don't like the way their life is going. They feel like they're just spinning their wheels, that they aren't accomplishing anything. They won't change. And yet they're afraid to do anything differently. Man, how long are you going to sit there till you die? You know, there was this one girl in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And every time I went to Charlotte to uh, Pastor Derry and Karen's church over here, and I went to their church, this girl and her mother came over from Winston-Salem and they brought a group of anywhere from 10 to 20 people every single time and they came. And this girl, when I first met her, was in high school and then she graduated and she went into, she was a lawyer's assistant and had a very profitable job. But every year we had talked to her and she says, I know I'm supposed to be there. I know I'm supposed to be there. And finally, one time I just pulled this verse on her and I said, Nicola, how long are you going to sit here till you die? Why don't you do something? And you know what? That girl just, she quit her job making lots of money. And her mother was dependent upon her. Her mother didn't have a job. And Nicola had to pay not only her expenses, but for her mother. And it's a long story, but it was a godly relationship. And her mother was a godly woman and stuff. But Nicola just had this responsibility and she just came out here on faith. And did you know what? She was so successful. I forget the exact way it happened, whether that company in Winston-Salem kept her and let her work long distance or they connected her with somebody out here. But anyway, she got another uh, job doing the exact same thing, was prosperous, gave her such an increase in money that she is able to pay all of her expenses and her mom's expenses. And did you know it's now been... I forget the exact numbers of years. Uh, Mike and Carrie, if they were in here, might be able to tell us. But I think she's been in Russia and over there ministering to people for 10 years or so. It just changed her life and it turned out to be the thing that thrust her into ministry. She's making the difference in people's lives. She's helping these babuskas over there. And I mean helping them and these orphans. She's ministering to them and she's doing things for people and her life is counting. And I guarantee you it's important. And it's because finally she just said, how long am I going to sit here until I die? I'm going to do something. And if I fail, well, praise God, I'd rather fail forward than sit here and be a failure. Man, this is great logic. And so they finally said, well, let's go out to the Syrians. The worst they can do is kill us. Why are we so afraid of dying? I know some of you right now are just absolutely shocked. But we sing about when we all get to heaven. What a day that's going to be. And then the doctor tells you, you're going and you cry. <laughs> Something's wrong with this. It's like David said tonight, death's just a door into another place. It's not that big of a deal. We're all going to die. And, man, and it's better. It's better than living forever like this. God's got something better planned. Why are we so afraid of failure? Why are we so afraid to do something? The biggest failure of all is doing nothing because you're afraid of failure. 
That is the ultimate failure. Man, you need to do something. Life is not a dress rehearsal. This is the real deal. You're burning daylight. If you don't make the decision this week with all of the things that have been said and are being preached to you, you are missing a huge opportunity. And if you come back next year in the same situation, you've wasted a year. Man, you need to make a commitment to God with all of your heart and just start doing what God gives you to do. Start with what you have right now and ask God to show you if there's more and God will direct you and he'll make your life count. You know, recently my brother-in-law died, Jamie's sister's brother-in-law. And he was what, 60, what? 69. And they were in a mall. I'd just been to a show and he just fell over dead. Man, he'd been healthy. And anyway, I did the funeral for him just a few weeks ago. And I got up and started by saying, you know, I've heard the saying often that you need to live so that the preacher doesn't have to lie at your funeral. And I said, I don't have to lie about David Dyer. This man, there is not a person who knew him that didn't know he was a Christian. And he witnessed to everything that moved. Saw his grandparents born again. He was in the public school system working with special ed. All of the teachers came. Some of the special ed students came. He had made a difference. He touched people's lives. And you know what? Most of you don't know David Dyer, but that man, he didn't do anything that was earth shattering but I guarantee you there's going to be people in eternity because of his life. What if every one of us just were faithful and were in, more in love with God than we were in love with ourselves and worried about what people were going to think about us? And what if we just went out and tried to make people's lives better and just lived for God every single day? You know what? That's success. And if God chooses to put you in a position where you influence large numbers of people, well then do it. But that's not what you have to do to be a success. You can be a success being anything. We need people doing all of these things. So these lepers, here were guys that were outcast. But you know what? Because they finally decided that we're going to do something. They went out to the Syrians and the Lord in answer to Elisha's prop prophecy had caused the Syrians to hear this sound like an army coming against them. And they thought that the Israelites had hired the Egyptians and they fled. They didn't even take anything with them. They still had food that was cooking. They left all of their gold, their raiment, their uh, animals tied. They just were running in panic. And the entire Syrian army had left. And when the lepers got out there to them, nobody was there. And so they went in and they started eating all of this food that was in abundance. They went from famine, from starving to death, to being gorged and having every need supplied. They took raiment, they took silver and gold. They went and hid it in the earth and dug holes. They went from being outcast and poverty stricken to being filthy, stinking rich in just a matter of minutes. And then they got convicted and said, you know what? We need to go tell the people in Samaria. This is a day of glad tidings and we, are gonna, we aren't going to be blessed of God if we hold it. And so they went to the people who had rejected them, who had kicked them out of the city and were willing to let them starve to death. And they went and told them the good news. And they went from being zeros to heroes in just a matter of minutes and brought deliverance to the entire city because somebody just got up and said, how long are we going to sit here till we die? They decided to do something. I'm telling you, you need to do something. Don't be so afraid of failure. Don't be so afraid of making a mistake. You will make mistakes. You know, when we moved into our previous building, it was actually a bigger step of faith in moving into here because at that time, uh, the percentage of increase that it took to get that $3.2 million for that other building was bigger than the $32 million. And it was a huge step and we moved in, but we were four months late. We wanted to move in in August in time for school to start and we didn't move in until November. And at the dedication service of that, I had one of the Bible college students come up and said, isn't it kind of sad? Are you discouraged that you missed the timing by four months? And I looked at them like, what's wrong with you? 
I said, man, this is the greatest miracle I've ever seen. I said, I did, I got in here. So what if I'm four months late? I said, I've never done anything perfectly in my life. I'm just thrilled that it worked. <laughs> but see, there are some people that think, oh, you got to do everything perfectly. And if you run into any hiccups, if you pray for healing, and if you aren't instantly healed, then they look at what hasn't happened instead of the fact that 50% of your pain is gone. And the way I look at that is, man, I'm, I'm on the winning side. I'm moving the devil in the right direction. Amen. And they're just so afraid that you're going to do something wrong. And so you do nothing and you become the greatest failure of all. I'm telling you, you need to step out. I know it's time for me to quit, but David took all my time. So let me <laughs> use, let me use one last passage over here in Matthew chapter 11. In Matthew chapter 11, this is Jesus speaking. And he said in verse 11, he says, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, which includes everybody but Jesus. I guess Jesus was born of women. So it includes everybody. <laughs> among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. This is saying that John the Baptist was greater than Moses, greater than Elijah, greater than Elisha, greater than David, greater than anybody. You talk about a success. John the Baptist was the greatest success over any of these people. And yet look at the last of that verse. Nevertheless, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. What we have in the new covenant is so superior that if you feel you are the weakest, puniest, sorry example of a saint in this auditorium, you're greater than John the Baptist, therefore greater than Moses, therefore greater than Elijah, because you have received this new birth. You have the nature of God on the inside of you. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, that's success. Success is knowing God. Let him that glories, glory in this, that he understands and knows me. You know, I'm saying the same thing over in different ways, but I'm trying to get across that success isn't all of these exterior things. It's all centered around Jesus. It's all knowing Jesus. It's all personal relationship. And if you ever tap into this and really begin to experience the love and the pleasure of God, I guarantee you nothing else in this world will compare and no other rejection from anybody else will bother you. You know, I haven't arrived. I'm not perfect, but I can tell you, I, I know that God loves me. I have a good relationship with God. God has revealed himself to me and I am so thrilled with God's acceptance that this is what allows me to take the criticism and the things that people give me. I've got thousands of blogs written about me. I've got one video on YouTube that I'm the most dangerous man in America because I believe that God is a good God instead of all of these things. And I've got terrible things said about me. And you know what? I just don't care because I know that God Almighty loves me. I have people come up to me and criticize me. I had a guy walk up one time and just start reaming me out and telling me all of the things that I said that were wrong. And you know what? I probably said some things that are wrong. If you came here looking for something wrong, I've got something for you. <laughs> Amen. I don't do things perfectly. I don't have any delusions about that. I don't ever make any mistake. But anyway, this guy was just blasting me and letting me have it. And I just stopped him right in the middle of it. And I said, who died and made you God? And he just stopped and looked at me like, what are you saying? I said, who are you? I don't know you. I don't care about your opinion. Why do I care what you think about me? And he just looked at me, well, you should care. And he started telling me how important he is. And I said, you know what? Compared to God, you're a zero with the rim knocked off. <laughs> And I said, if God Almighty loves me enough that he counted me faithful and he put me in the ministry, what do I care about your opinion? Woo! I don't give a rip what you think. <laughs> Amen. And I'm telling you, once you come into this relationship where you know God and you feel his pleasure and you're doing what he told you to do, it just makes you so that you're like Teflon. Nothing sticks. <laughs> 
People can criticize you and you don't go out of your way to offend people, but you know what? You're just doing what you know to do. And God is saying, at a boy, at a girl, He's saying, you're doing good. It's like a kid when they fall off the bike, a good parent doesn't sit there and say, you idiot, if you would have done it the way I said, and he doesn't criticize you, a good parent will say, you know what? You went five feet, try it again. You can do better. God's not gonna sit here and criticize you. God loves you. And if you ever enter into that relationship and quit being so goal oriented and thing oriented and evaluating success in these carnal things. And if you evaluate success in God's acceptance and pleasure, it'll just inoculate you against so much of what the devil tries to do. The fear of man brings a snare. And if you aren't afraid of men, if you aren't afraid of their opinion and you don't have to live up to somebody's standard to become a success and you're just doing what God tells you, then even if you are being sold into slavery. You can have a great relationship knowing that God, I'm right where you want me to be. I love you and things are going to work out. Regardless of what's going on, you can serve God. And I tell you, this is what God intended us to be. I believe that this is God's way to succeed. And very few people are taking this path. And because of it, that's the reason they may accumulate all of these natural things, but they're dying on the inside. There are people right here that you may be a success in the eyes of the world, but boy, you're empty. And I'm telling you, it all comes back to the Lord. You got a God-shaped space on the inside of you that you were created in His image and you aren't gonna be happy and content and you won't be a success until you fill that space with God. And when you are occupied with God and thinking about how much He loves you, I guarantee you, it just, what else matters? The apostle Paul said, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. So they'd put him in prison and said, we're going to kill you. And he'd just kiss them. Oh, awesome. <laughs> for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And he says, well, then we're going to let you go. And he says, awesome. I'm going to go tell them about Christ. <laughs> well, we're going to beat you. And he'd just break out into song in the middle of the night with his feet and hands in the stock. And they'd go to worshiping God. God get to tap in his foot and an earthquake comes and just sets them all free and the jailer and all of the prisoners get saved. And you know, how do you intimidate a guy that if you kill him, wonderful. If you let him live, awesome. For him to live is Christ, to die is gain. You can't get to a guy like that. And I'm telling you, when you find your life, your success, everything that you are seeking in life is all centered in God and not other things. It just makes you different. It makes you that the things of this world don't bother you the way that they did. No big deal. Amen. Amen. I encourage you to adopt that attitude. It would change your life. God loves you more than you realize. And if you really understood the mercies of God, you would be a living sacrifice. Amen. 